What is up guys, welcome to Garage 23. Today we are continuing with the Pathfinder Revival project and the list just keeps getting bigger. Uh, we need to do the front brakes now because I think the only thing that was stopping it was the rear pads all by themselves because there's like nothing left on the front pads. So we need to take care of that too now. Uh, along with the speed sensor or something wrong with the speedometer, the speedometer doesn't work. Most of our gauges didn't work, but we got the fuel gauge working last time along with the fuel pump replacement. And then we tried fixing the door hinge last time and that didn't really work out because we needed whole new door hinges. So we got those in. I think that's about it for today. So let's get started. Okay, first off, got to jack up the car. So it looks like our rotor's still in good shape. There's not really any deep grooves or anything in it. The lip's not even all that deep either, so they're not super old. If your pad had gotten down to like the bare metal, then you'd probably need to replace the rotor because it would get like too chewed up. And then if you left it that way, the rough surface would end up chewing up your new pad prematurely. So it, it gets expensive if you keep it ignoring it, but we got it just in time. So let's get the caliper off and put the new pads in. And before we take the caliper off, we can push the pistons back in. And here's, oh no. Yeah, so that's what I was talking about. The pad is entirely gone. Oh so it looks like that was probably chewing up our rotor. And the front one still had a very little <laughs> sliver of life left. The story has come to an end. So this is exactly what I was talking about. See how the surface on the edge of the rotor here is like super rough? And it's got really deep grooves. Like you, you can hear them, not only feel them with your nail. So that, if we leave this rotor, is gonna prematurely eat up our pad. So we should replace the rotors. I don't know if I really want to do that right now, especially because these rotors are weird and they're like in between the hub. Yeah, I think we're just going to send it. This isn't a daily. If this was your daily, I would definitely recommend that you replace the rotor. But this is just for short trips to the junkyard and whatnot. So we're just going to go ahead and put the knee pads in, which have a lifetime warranty anyway. <laughs> Pistons, we didn't quite get one of them all the way back in. So another method you can use is some big channel locks. And just push it in like that. And that should be ready for your new pads. And these pins don't slide anymore. So I think I figured everything out, more or less. So the caliper slide pins are pretty rusted and they're seized in, in the bracket. And I was gonna go buy some new ones, but I scoured through the random pile of junk that I haven't thrown away. And I found the calipers, the stock calipers from the 350Z. And these look like they're exactly the same. Just a lot less gross. So we're just gonna use these because they're free. Pays to be a hoarder. Uh, as for the rotor, I just thought we have this machine now that we could potentially use to resurface the rotor. So I figured, yeah, might as well give it a shot. I have no idea how the hell this stupid rotor comes apart because this is all new to me. Like, why is a rotor in between, sandwiched in between everything? But I'm just gonna start unbolting stuff and see how it goes.
Weird. I think there's a C clip in there or something. complicated just to change the rotors. I'm kind of debating making this thing two-wheel drive just because I don't really want to deal with this. I didn't need it to be four-wheel drive and I found out that apparently you can't leave it in four-wheel drive so it's not like an all-wheel drive car like a Skyline or Subaru or Evo or something like that. So that takes away like all the fun out of it honestly so kind of don't see a point in keeping the front diff and axles and junk in here but I don't know what do you guys think? Should I leave it four-wheel drive? Lift it, lower it, two-wheel drive. Hmm. Well, I ran out of bolts and it still hasn't come off. Wank. <laughs> oh, there we go. I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, there we go. So the little rings that are behind here screw on to this shaft that's threaded, which I thought was the part that you're supposed to unscrew, but it wasn't. It was the outer part that unscrews from that. Again, overly complicated. I still think this is stupid, but it comes off now. And I think, yeah, these bearings are separate from the hub itself. So this is like an old Chevy. I think so. I have kind of dealt with something like this and I bolted the rotor so this should have come apart. It's like so much more messy too. There's like grease literally on everything. Like the, the sealed wheel bearing is like so much nicer. <laughs> it's so dumb. So now we're left with our chewed up rotor and let's see if we can mount this in the lathe and make it unugly. So this happens to have about three little spaces that look like they're, they're going to fit in pretty nicely. Something like that. See if it works. Okay, should be good to go. And give this one a shot. Probably start out slow and see what happens. So we're gonna go with 240 RPMs because 240. good we got most of it there's just like a little half ring section here that's a little deeper than everything else and it's already taking forever as it is mostly because I don't know what I'm doing but it's at least better than it was so I'm happy with that oh it's hot that's hot that is hot I'll clean that later that's that's one thing about cast iron is it doesn't come off in chips. It like makes this little dust that gets everywhere. And this is the most important thing to clean off your lathe because here we'll act like sandpaper and just grind the crap out of all of your, your precision surfaces. So I'm gonna clean that later. But first we gotta put this back together. Ah, sweet baby Jesus. Quit. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, now we need to do the door hinges on the driver's side. The rest of them seem to be fine. It seems to be just the driver's side that's the most worn out, and obviously that makes sense. That's the one that technically gets used the most. Um, I thought it was the bushings that are inside this, this rod piece, but it turns out that the hinge itself is worn, and the, the part that holds this rod isn't circular anymore. And luckily, Amazon carries those too. So this part, I can show you on the new piece. This piece here is what's worn out and like oblong on those. And that's what creates the play in the door. And we managed to adjust them a little bit and make it a little better, but it's still not perfect. As you can see it like hits on the door before it hits on the latch. And that translates to you having to like slam the door most of the time. And usually that ends up causing other stuff to break, like your door panel. <laughs> yeah. But we have these new ones, so we can go ahead and replace these. Looks like we got the right ones. So I need to take this C-clip off of the pin. And then that pin can come out. Probably doesn't help that they're all dusty. Now we can remove the hinge. So you can see it's all rusty and it's kind of hard to tell, but it is like a little bit uh, out of round toward the edge here. So now we slide the new one on. You can hear that it's only hitting on the latch. Whereas before it was like hitting on the door and then like kind of like ramping up onto the latch. And that's what makes it a pain in the ass to close. But when you got it aligned perfectly, it's much easier to close. I was gonna replace both of them, but the top one's what did most of the work. So I'm just gonna save that extra one just in case one of the other ones goes out. Okay, now we need to tackle probably the most annoying thing about driving this truck so far, and that's the clutch pedal. And that's because I think it's leaking internally or something because it doesn't seem to hold pressure. If you keep your foot on it, you can feel the clutch start to let out even though you're still holding the clutch. And then during normal operation, it keeps getting stuck to the floor and you have to like pick it back up with your foot and then pump it a few times for it to work. And lately it's been taking like a few pumps just to get it into gear the first time and yeah that's pretty annoying especially when you're stuck in traffic and you need to like get going so it's about time we swap this one out first thing we got to do is unhook the clutch master cylinder from the clutch pedal all right so this is our clutch pedal and then this rod back here this is what comes off of our clutch master cylinder and so this clip right here and i don't know if you can see it that clip and pin is what we need to remove to detach the rod from the pedal itself. And it's, yeah, it's pretty tricky to get to. Like it's hard enough for moving this, let alone like putting it back how it was. Oh, there goes the pin. There's a clip. Hey. Ta -da. So now, that rod isn't connected to our pedal anymore and we should be able to pull it out once we unbolt everything in the engine bay. All right, now that we got the broken old ugly one out, we can put a nice shiny new one in. Jeez, barely even fits between the brake booster. 
And this could have been made a lot easier if they would have just moved this clutch cylinder just half an inch over a little bit, but no. Or made the stupid brake booster a little smaller, that would have helped, but no. All this room, and you gotta cram this thing right up next to the brake booster. All right, now you gotta put the little pin thing back along with the little clip and I want to do some stretches before this part because it's probably going to take a while. Five hours later. <sighs> okay. That part's never fun on like any car. All right, now we got everything all tightened up and ready to go. And now it's time for camera girl's favorite part. Splitting the brakes. Oh, come on. First, you got to fill it up with brake fluid. And so we're using dot three brake fluid for our clutch. All right, so now we're gonna have camera girls start pumping the brakes. And as you can see, we still got some bleeding to do because the pedal's still getting stuck at the bottom. So we need to pump it a few times. And then once we bleed all the air out, it should start coming back up on its own. All right, so now we got the system completely bled and the pedal acts and feels like it should. Uh, I should add, I had to adjust the fork on the clutch master cylinder out a little bit because uh, out of the box, it was a little too compressed. So even though we were pressing the pedal all the way down, it wasn't actually pressing the cylinder in all the way. So we had to extend it out a little bit. So that way the pedal starts engaging the cylinder as soon as you press it and that gave us more pressure in the system and that helped a lot when bleeding it. It was kind of like as if we were pushing only halfway at first so it was taking forever to bleed it but now it works perfect. All right that's our clutch taken care of so now we shouldn't have any drivability issues or any sketchy moments with the clutch getting stuck in traffic. Next thing up is fixing the last of our non-functioning gauges so that's going to be the speedometer which initially I thought it was just going to be like a speed sensor or something or a wire on the speed sensor or something not being plugged in and well, I guess it kind of is. Uh, when I did the LEDs on the gauge cluster, I noticed that the speedometer looked kind of funny in the back and it didn't, didn't have any terminals on it. I was like, what the heck is this? But it turns out this car is so old, it doesn't use a speed sensor, it uses a speed cable. So we were lucky enough to find one of those at the junkyard and now we got to try and put it in. Hopefully it's not too big of a deal with the engine in here because it was super easy with at the junkyard with no engine, so let's see how it goes. All right, so this is our speed cable, and it's a pretty rudimentary way of measuring your speed because all this really does is transfer the movement of a gear inside the transmission, and it takes that rotation and transfers it to the gauge cluster to the gears inside there and turn your odometer and speedometer and lets you know how fast you're going. This is like what you would see in old movies like uh, Matilda where the dad's like a shady salesman and he'll take this end of the transmission cable and put it on a drill and just wind it back really fast backwards so it would turn down the mileage on the car. I'm pretty sure that these don't do that anymore because there was like fail safes because they figured out people did that but that was pretty neat. <laughs> It's already not looking good. And of course that's not gonna be this easy. And it looks like the intake manifold's gonna have to come off. Oh no! Turn it bed. Okay, so where we left off last time, uh, we figured out that we need to remove the whole intake manifold just to get our speedometer cable back in. So I did all that. And now we can thread this guy back through the engine bay. Now this guy can fit back through here. But yeah, we even got bolt holes there for this bracket. So that sits there. If I only knew where those bolts were. But anyway, we also had to take the gauge cluster out to secure that end inside the dash. And things started getting a little out of hand. So yeah, things got a little complicated. Before I started doing this, I kept noticing like a weird smell in the cabin um, the last couple of days. 
and I couldn't really figure out what it was. When I started um, taking the intake manifold apart, I noticed that there was a little puddle under the passenger side over there. The heck could possibly be leaking? Like It looked kind of like when you have your AC running in summer and it drips like condensation on the floor. It looked like that, but I mean, the truck was off. The AC doesn't even work for one. And it's been parked in here for a couple of days. So it's like, what? why would that be leaking? And then I looked under the truck to see where it was coming from. It was just like under the seat. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> so I started looking under the carpet and stuff. Then I remembered um, I had seen like a little, couple little drops of coolant under the dash. And I was like, oh, the uh, heater core might be leaking. And I remember that and I was like, oh God, please no. And it did turn out to be the heater core that just started like leaking profusely and it was just dumping all the coolant out in under the carpet. And since the carpet's so dark and dirty, I couldn't tell that it was like completely sloshy over there in that corner. And so much that it was just like running down the floorboard and dripping out under the passenger seat. So yeah, this thing was still is leaking all over the inside. Um, this whole seam, it looks like uh, is kind of corroded and we had to go get a new one. But to get this one out required literally taking the entire interior apart. Cause, and I mean, it's not like this is Nissan's fault. Most cars are like this, but it goes in the back of like the vent control unit, I guess. This is what sits against the firewall here. So obviously you have to get your dash and gauges and literally everything out to get this out, to flip it over and to yank out the heater core. Yeah, this has been fun. But we did manage to get another one. So now we just got to put all this mess back. Oh, and another fun surprise that we encountered here is this thing had some kind of wiring short at some point because a lot of these wires are melted and this wire is like extra crispy. I'm not entirely sure what the deal is with that because everything else seemed to work and the wires that were sitting out bare for the stereo seemed to all be accounted for. So I don't know what specifically that went to, but I mean, all we can do now is just make sure that all the bare wires are covered and just tape all this back together. All right, glad that's over with. All put back together and now we just got to connect our speed sensor back together and that should be it, finally. All right, so now we just got this cable that we need to connect to the transmission and it's got these little clips all along the body to hold it in place. So just snap them in there. And then the cable itself, it has a little keyway. It can be kind of hard to tell, but it has a little notch and that's gonna correspond with the part in the transmission that it's gonna slot into. And then this just screws on and holds it in place. So just need to spin it to match it up with where the notch is on the transmission. And it should slot in easily. If it doesn't, don't force it because the last thing you want to do is break it. There it goes. And then just thread the retainer on. And yeah, it should be good. And that's it. This thing needs so much work <laughs> over it. <laughs> All right, glad that's over with. The heater core is like the worst job to do on like any car, so glad we're done with that. Although we replaced it with a used unit, so we're probably gonna have to do that again at some point. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. On the next episode, we're finally gonna get to do some fun stuff though. Suspension, wheels, tires, still a little bit more brakes to go, but it is what it is. So stay tuned for the next one. See you guys next time and as always, do your best. Dekira